after e4, e5, and f4, the king's gambit is on the board. So as mentioned in previous videos, black goes on with d5, a counter gambit. And after pawn takes in d5 and pawn takes in f4, let's start with the main move, knight to f3. So black goes on with knight to f6. There's no reason to take the pawn in d5 with the queen because that will lose the tempo to knight c3. You will have to move the queen again it's, and it's like you're playing some sort of Scandinavian. So now there's many many replies that white can go for and it's, it's an open game there was an initial swap of pawns so there's going to be too many different options i'm not going to be able to cover everything like what if white plays a3 now you see i'm not going to make, make a video that goes through a3 and then maybe white plays a4 and then a5 like he's losing his mind or something like if you want to watch a video where somebody's losing their minds just watch videos of young students having their opinions challenged so let's see how to take it from here if white plays the most passive reply like bishop e2 for example okay take the pawn with the knight and after castle white is prioritizing king safety black however can already start an attack h6 the idea is to play g5 and then g4 and so on and the pawn in f4 will be supported and will be a thorn in the back of the white player after d4 let's say for example to keep in, to, to develop the bishop potentially to target this pawn to put pressure on it g5 right so i'm just showing the setup and after and after c4 kicking out kicking out the knight knight to e7 this is a crucial move you'll see why in a minute g3 by white challenging this strong pawn and trying to take it for free Black plays bishop to h3. So the game has been compromised for a while. And the black player is just exposing the weaknesses and the vulnerability of King's Gambit players that don't really know exactly what they're doing. And you'll see how many lines we're going to punish in this video. Rook to e1 now. Saving the rook from the bishop. We take the pawn in g3. Pawn takes back. And now bishop to g7. The bishop is best placed in this square. And we planning to castle as soon as possible so after knight c3 and castle this is how the game looks like both kings look quite unsafe but this king looks less safe since we have a fianchetto and an extra two pawns on our king side after best moves we're just playing best moves by white in a faulty variation queen to b3 for example targeting this pawn in b7 activating the queen connecting the rook soon enough when the bishop is developed too late g4 attacking the knight and Knight, let's say knight to knight to e5 seems like a possibility, but it's just it's just lost. It's game over because of this move. Queen check, and you're winning material. But even if the knight had gone somewhere else, this this check with the queen, this bishop and queen cutting off the board like lasers, it's devastating. And in this position, after g4, if queen goes for b7, which is exactly what the queen was going for, just don't worry, just develop the knight, and the knights are defending each other. So at this point, the knight is under attack, and yeah, moving the knight just gives the exact same result of what happened before. If d5 coming with an attack on the knight, this is not a problem because you can take the knight in f3 with an attack on the bishop, and you'd be winning material. So let's look at another setup so that we can learn as much as possible to beat the king's gambit. d5 comes, the counter gambit, and when they take us in d5, you take in f4. Remember, in the previous video I showed, you have to watch the first and second video to understand everything here because there's a here you have queen h4 is an idea now of course knight f3 is the best move by white because it stops that it stops that and also develops the piece black goes on with knight f6 attacking the pawn now here it seems to make sense to play c4 this is what they mostly play defending the pawn and developing another pawn towards the center so it looks like it makes sense however you just play this move so remember this pattern c6 and you are winning this pawn no matter what the most common line is to take, of course, because this is gonna this was gonna be a completely free pawn for black. So after take, take back with the knight develop. And now let's look at two replies. One of them is d4, the main move. And it makes perfect sense. This is what if, if you play against the King's Gambit or if you're a King's Gambit player, you know this is one of the usual moves you will play. And you put the two pawns in the center. Black has zero pawns in the center because you offer the F pawn. That's the whole point of being a King's Gambit player. However, you're not really doing fine here if you play this as white. Bishop before check. And now let's look at two options to block this check. One of them is bishop d2, the other one is knight c3. There's plenty of things that can happen, but either way, black is already like evaluated minus 150 or something. And it, it, things can only get worse for white. So let's see, for example, bishop to d2, right? This black goes on with castling. And this bishop is unremovable from b4. 
In fact, playing a3 now seems to be making perfect sense because you got loads of pawns. You got majority here. You got four against two. So you want to start pushing these pawns. Well. Either white wants to force our bishop to trade and then take back and then just start pushing these pawns, like these four pawns against these two. Or in case we retreat, b4, b5, and d5. All of these would, might potentially be past pawns. However, this uh, innocent looking move is is the self-killer of the white player. Rook to e8 wins for black straight away. After the bishop blocks, well, okay, well, king f2 doesn't make sense because knight e4 check. Well, you don't want to go on the same file of the rook because then the knight will be able to give a discover check and win the queen. So king to g1, and now black simply plays knight to d4. Position is a minus 7 because white will be forced to give up the queen. If knight takes back, then queen d4 ends the game. If whatever other thing, you just play knight takes with check and you're infiltrating with the queen, queen to d4, maybe queen to b6, the knight is protecting f2, it's either checkmate or white will have to give up so much material, 7 points of material according to the engine. In this position after bishop b4 check and bishop d2, we're looking at castle, all good, all normal, then a3 loses the game immediately, rook to a8 check and after bishop blocks in e2, a really crazy line is coming. Black now ignores the bishop being attacked by the pawn and plays knight to d4. Well, obviously we want to play rook e2 check with a million threats and the queen will be probably a victim of that. Besides, we got the infiltration of our pieces. So after the knight in f3 gets rid of this very strong knight putting pressure on the pinned piece in front of the king, Black now takes the bishop. Knight takes back, you can just take the knight in d4 with the queen and keep applying pressure you're gonna play bishop g4 potentially you might just take the pawn in c4 so if the queen takes in d2 it looks like white is up a piece white is up a piece but still you're gonna play knight e4 and now you're gonna be winning this knight back except this king is completely dead the knight is controlling f2 and d2 look position evaluated around minus 6 or minus 7 i really i forgot at this point but what's white gonna do okay queen to d1 puts the queen back, also keeps controlling this knight, keeps defending it. However, it's just too late. Queen to h4 check, and now you're checkmating. g3 is pointless, you can just take back. At this very point, so position evaluated like minus 13. So, come on guys, I mean, let's move on. So let's make a recap, actually, to help us familiarize with the setups. Okay, they take the pawn in d5, we take in f4, knight f3, knight f6. And in the variation where they defend the pawn, we challenge it with another pawn and we're trying to win a free pawn in the center. So when they take, knight c6. And after d4, apparently normal move, but this actually just gives black a good advantage after bishop b4 check. And earlier we went through bishop d2 and everything that happens next. Let's look at knight c3. Castle. And after bishop recaptures the pawn in f4, this looks like the perfect setup that the white player was looking for. The two knights normally develop, two pawns in the center, bishop in f4 recapturing the gambited pawn, and white is also up a pawn. However, black plays a very strong move, knight to e4, putting extra attack over c3. The idea of course is to take, 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 and then make a fork to take the rook. We all know that tactic. It's not really a tactic. Anyway, you can say it's a tactic to feel good about yourself. Now, white will have to defend this knight further, so after, let's say, queen to c2, also to allow development. Either way, it doesn't matter too much to us because we're going to play an incredible sequence of moves. Really unexpected. What do you do to a pinned piece like this knight? You put pressure on it, right? The PPPP rule. And I don't mean it like, like go to the toilet multiple times. I mean put pressure on the pinned piece. So, well, my name is Endgame Strategies, so I don't care about it. I'm just going to take the pinned piece. Knight takes in C3, the most counterintuitive, crazy move you've seen. Because now the pawn takes back with an attack on the bishop, and it looks like we've given away the initiative, but no, because we don't care. The next move is even crazier. Knight to d4. And now we're attacking the queen. And this pawn can't take us because it's pinned, but the pawn can take the bishop. No, that's not true, because then knight takes queen and black wins, but the knight can take the knight. Okay, knight takes, queen takes back. Again, the pawn cannot take this bishop because it's pinned, otherwise queen takes rook. The pawn cannot take this queen because otherwise bishop takes king. So at this point, white's best move is bishop to d2, unpinning something. Well, unpinning the pawn, but it's just too late. Rook e8 check, and after bishop to e2 blocking, the crazy line continues. Rook takes. Boom. It's an incredible move. King takes back, and now 
bishop g4 check. And after the king moves, well, where? King to f1, obviously, because king to e1 will still run into rook e8, finishing development. Anyway, king to f1, queen to c4 check. It's too late. We build this unescapable mate net. The king going like where? To f2, maybe? Okay, either way, well, e1, you can just check with the rook and you bring the pieces. King to f2, bishop c5 check, king moves, and now bishop to d6 check. If king goes back, then queen to e2, obviously, since the bishop is protecting, since the bishop is attacking this diagonal. So after bishop d6 check and king moves to h4, things don't change too much because now bishop to d1 wins the queen. Since it's a discovered check, but uh, even more than winning the king at the queen, I guess we're just gonna checkmate because when the king moves to h5, no, I'm kidding, no, there's a bishop. When the king goes to g5, queen g4 is checkmate.